Hello, and welcome to a new show. I decided to put Legends of the Force on hold for a little bit for a project that I've wanted to do for a while, and that I finally decided to get to, and also I kind of wanted to avoid burnout on Star Wars, so there's that. So, welcome to Breaking Down the Nightfall Saga, a video essay series where I go through one of Batman's biggest and arguably longest storylines. Probably unmatched until we get to No Man's Land and the stuff leading up to that. And we're going to begin on the road to Nightfall with the origins of one of the integral supporting characters to this story and its general supporting cast. Tim Drake, the third Robin. Our first part of Robin's origin ran in Detective Comics 618 to 612. These issues were written by Alan Grant with pencils by Norm Brayfogel. Inks by Dick Giordano on the first issue, uh, 618, and Steve Mitchell for the rest. Colors by Adrienne Wari, letters by Todd Klein, and edited by the legendary Denny O'Neill. This story ran from July to September 1990. Tim Drake's origin does not shy away in the slightest from the lingering baggage of Jason Todd's fate, with the very first page having Tim Drake reacting to Jason Todd's costume in on display in the Batcave. It's also in the middle of the room, which seems like an impractical design, and later artists are going to move the case to an alcove in a side wall. Batman and Tim Drake, not yet Robin, have been investigating a hacker known as the Money Spider, who has been stealing millions of dollars from various bank accounts at different banks in the city. This whole bit here is a good showcase for what makes Tim Drake a very different Robin from Jason Todd and Dick Grayson. Grayson and Todd's big contributions as Robin were being another fighter to go alongside Batman, although each with different fighting styles reflecting their backgrounds. Grayson, being spry and acrobatic, is fitting with being part of a troop of circus acrobats, and Jason Todd, as a street kid, being more of a scrappy brawler. Tim Drake's introduction is that of a detective, which fits prior to the story as he basically figured out the identities of Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson through some very skilled detective work. And in any other universe, he probably would have been a boy detective like Encyclopedia Brown, The Hardy Boys, Conan Edokawa, that group of people. As far as Tim Drake's parents are concerned, they are currently alive and well, unlike Dick Grayson and Jason Todd's parents. And they are both rich corporate magnets flying over the Caribbean near Haiti after returning from a trip to Africa. They are also pretty damn close to a divorce, and they're doing that sitcom argument thing where two people are sitting right next to each other and refusing to speak directly to each other, only through an intermediary, and both are acknowledging what the other has said before the intermediary can relay it, to which their pilot's response can be summarized as follows. I hate all these damn rich people. However, the pilot is forced to divert when he's contacted by a figure calling himself the Obia Man, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. Uh, the term basically means sorcerer with regards to the voodoo faith. And the Obia man, or Obia man tells the pilot to, div to divert to an improvised landing strip in the jungles of Haiti, at which point the Obia man's men take Jack, Janet, and their lawyer hostage and shoot the pilot. This whole plot, also I should mention, is interspersed with a side plot involving a young kid, Pierre, living in poverty in Haiti while, who, while his father, Louis, works for the Obia man. Louis also says he has a baka chained up in a cabinet in the house, a baka being, in voodoo, a minor demon or other form of trickster spirit who can be kind of bound for service. But you gotta be careful with. The worst issue ends with Tim hearing on the news that his parents' plane is, plane is missing, and Tim fearing the worst. Issue 619 opens after the hostage tape has been recorded, and Jack and Janet's lawyer has been murdered by the Obia man. Beaman's followers are a little hesitant now that murder is involved, but Louis is a true believer, and he is sent to run the hostage tape to the airport. In Gotham, Tim is anxious and worried, but there's nothing that they can do, and Bruce even offers to take the night off from being Batman to be with Tim, something I bet you, and certainly I at the time, never thought I'd hear Batman say. Meanwhile, in Haiti, Pierre has a horrific nightmare that feels very inspired by Bill Sienkiewicz's art, where the Baca breaks out of the cabinet and goes to attack him. At the police station, Krista Gordon tells Batman that Drake Industries received the hostage tape and turned it over to the police in accordance to their policy, which also is not to pay the ransom. And the tape and the tape directly informs them not to inform the police, in addition to, of course, paying the ransom, so they're already not following instructions. Batman borrows the tape, and doing some enhancement on the footage and some additional research in the Bat Library, he determines that the hostage takers are in Haiti. 
While Batman is researching this, Tim comes down to the Batcave and sees the freeze frame of the tape and is understandably very upset. It eventually kind of calms down to a very scary, Batman-esque facial expression. But for now, there's nothing Tim can do, and little Batman can do until after the ransom call comes in. And the ransom call comes in. So Batman heads off, leaving Tim and Alfred in the Batcave, and Tim wondering if being an orphan is the fate of all who become Robin. Issue 620 opens with the Ransom pickup going pear-shaped as the Obia Man's representative sent a biker gang to do the pickup, sowing massive amounts of confusion. The bikers manage to lose the police, but not the Bat, as Batman is able to tail the money to the second handoff and in turn to the airport, where Bruce Wayne is going to catch a plane to Haiti. That morning in Gotham, Tim meditates and decides to focus his attention on the one thing that he can work on and can have an impact on. The Money Spider. By following where the money goes after the Money Spider has stolen it, Tim figures out that the Money Spider isn't just a hacker, he's a hacktivist. Though that word doesn't exist yet, so nobody in the book actually uses it. Instead, Tim is able to get the hacker's phone number and goes to confront them in person. Meanwhile, Bruce has arrived in Haiti. At Gotham Juvenile Hall, Tim goes to confront who he suspects to be the hacker. Lonnie Matchin, aka Anarchy. Tim is actually sympathetic with Anarchy in his goals and wants to talk it over, but Anarchy has none of it. Shoves the headmaster. You know, Anarchy, if you want to do some more good with your hacktivism, there are much better targets than Wayne Corp to steal your money from. Lex Corp, for starters. I mean, God knows Lex has got his fingers in all sorts of shady pies. And yes, Lex Corp security is brutal and nasty, and they'll probably come trying to kill you. You're, they also would have to come to Gotham to try to kill you, which means they'd step into Batman's turf. And I figure, one, Batman would have problems with their methods, and two, it's not like it's not in your style to play Batman and, and, and Lex Luthor against each other. Satisfied with the job well done, Tim returns to Wayne Manor, only to learn from Alfred that Bruce has also returned and things did not go as well for him. The final issue of this art, issue 621, opens on Bruce and Tim looking through the window on something that hasn't been revealed yet, asking if Tim wants to hear what happened. Tim wants to know. We flash back to Haiti as Bruce tails the bagman, Malicien, to Louis' home. And then that evening, when Malicien and Louis head to where the hostages are held, Batman follows. At the hostage site, the Obia man has Jack and Janet tied to a post in a ring of hot coals and fire, and is taunting them while they suffer from heat stroke. The Obia man takes the money, but has no intention of releasing his hostages. So, as the Obia Man encourages his followers to firewalk with him, Batman strikes, fighting the uh, followers and the Obia Man himself on the coals and in the safe area at the middle of the Ring of Fire. Batman is able to quickly free Jack and Janet, who quickly rush to some of the water that the Obia Man had taunted them with. During this, Louise tries to attack Batman, only for the Bat to dodge a thrown axe, which in turn hits Louis, mortally wounding him and knocking him onto the coals, causing him to burn to death. Worse, this distracts Batman from Jack and Janet, who go for some water that the Obia man had been taunting them with, as mentioned earlier, and drink, only discover that it is poisoned with a neurotoxin. Distraught, uh, Batman plows through the Obia man's men and rushes Jack and Janet to a hospital. However, he was too late. Janet is dead, and Jack is paralyzed from the neurotoxin. As Tim learns this, Bruce Wayne remembers another child, decades earlier, whose entire world came crashing down on them through an act of cruelty. And in Haiti, Pierre had broken into the cabinet and found not a demon, but a ball of mud, sticks, bone, and feathers, which he cast into the fireplace, and now wonders what's keeping his father, who is certainly going to um, beat the crap out of him once he gets home. Except he's not going to come home. This is a great story set up for Tim Drake. It shows what's going to make him a different Robin than Dick Grayson and Jason Todd through his basically being more of a detective than a scrappy bruiser or just a fighter in general. Um, while also giving another push into the path of them being a max hero instead of what would have otherwise been, otherwise been a perfectly reasonable path of the boy detective. I just kind of wish they hadn't fridged his mother. We already started the story with Jack and Janet being on the road to divorce. You don't need to kill her off. You just have them divorce. Our next installment on the road to Nightfall is, will be The Rise of Robin, Issue 2, 
as we jump to Batman for a slightly shorter three-issue storyline. I'll see you then. Okay, good. Let's see if the cat behaves herself. No, she doesn't. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 